this here again. <laughs> Let us continue praising the Lord's name this morning with your voices to page 29 for our call to worship. Glorify thy name. Let's sing all three verses. We please stand and sing this together as a church. Who's <laughs> out there with us? We welcome you. Oh, 
Uh, one is a tribute, and the other is going to be a, a message. So uh, come out and be a part of our evening service. Uh, we do have a time of hymn singing, your favorite, uh, time of testimony. And then uh, in the evenings, our, our deacons have been stepping up and, and sharing uh, from the pulpit. And it's always good uh, to get a different word from another individual. Then tomorrow night, 6 p.m., uh, the search committee will be meeting again uh, down in my uh, office. So uh, 6 o'clock, uh, come ready uh, to be prayed up and then uh, do some additional work. And then Wednesday night, uh, Wednesday night, uh, we started last Wednesday with our uh, dinner program at 5, our Olympians at 5.30, and then uh, our junior and senior high group meeting at 6, as well as our Bible study uh, starting back up again. Had a very good turnout <coughs> last week. Uh, this week we're having uh, pasta, uh, meatballs, uh, bread, and salad. So uh, it may be a little different on the schedule, but uh, as we went through and looked at where we're at, uh, we've got about 10 more uh, sessions to go before our, our closing program in the middle of May. Uh, so we'll try to change the menu up a little bit, but come out, uh, enjoy a good meal, and then a time of coming to the Word of God, if you're coming to the Bible study. And uh, I think we had a good turnout in the youth group, uh, about 10 or 12 there, uh, which was good to see. Uh, if you've got friends, invite them to our different programs. We'd love to see you uh, there as well. And again, just a reminder, next Saturday at 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary, we'll be having a memorial service for Chet Smeaky. Uh, again, I know some of you uh, have been approached to, to be involved. Uh, and again, uh, just keep it that lifted up in prayer so that we can, again, uh, remember Chet. And I know his family will be here, and uh, they would certainly appreciate your prayers as well. Okay, those are all the documents I have, Kim. I just want to take this time to thank all those who are stepping up and putting yourself in a position to be used by the Lord within the church ministries here. That's everybody that's stepped forward for the Wednesday night programs, the Sunday evening programs, the Sunday morning programs, our back room that's full of children. Um, from the deacons, through the Holy Spirit, we thank you and we uh, just give you honor and glory and praise to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the work that you are doing within the church. Amen. I'm changing a hymn to 399, Higher Ground. Let's go to the higher ground here. 399, can you please stand and sing this together? And those for children's church.
unite your hearts with the Lord. I gave the prayer list out to those that were here earlier and from back there. If you didn't get one, please get one on the way out. And take that with you to have that during the week to be praying over the prayers and the praises that have taken place. Um, we have a... Can I say the name? Is it okay? Go ahead. Amen, and that's when it's not on your list, so you'll have to pencil or ink that one in for, uh, and we'll get it readjusted for next week also. Pastor, come in. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, one of the great privileges we have is the privilege of prayer. And Lord, we know that you have said that we need to pray without ceasing. And Lord, that means that we are to live in an attitude of prayer, that we are in constant touch with you, and that Lord, when things come upon us, when brothers and sisters in Christ ask us to pray for them, we don't have to wonder where you are. We know that you're right there with us, that you hear and answer prayers in so many different mighty ways. And this morning, Lord, we have heard Joanne's request, Lord. We know what's on her heart. And Lord, we know all that Joanne and her family have been through. And this change, Lord, that's about to take place is certainly one that's heart-wrenching. It is one that touches us in our very soul. And so, Lord, we join with Joanne in lifting up the request that she has made today. That first and foremost, Lord, that you would just give her that quiet spirit. That, Lord, you would just place that hand of comfort upon her. May she feel the power of the Holy Spirit moving within her. And, Lord, as Maddie and Jamal head to the West Coast, we just pray, Lord, that uh, you will guide and direct their footsteps. That, Lord, you would lead them to a place where they can fellowship in a church that preaches the Lord Jesus Christ and lifts up his name. We pray, Lord, that you would move in the heart of her husband and that, Lord, you would speak to him, you would draw him to you. We know, Lord, that without Christ in a person's life, their life is really aimless and without proof. So, Lord, we pray uh, a hedge of protection around the whole family. We ask you, Lord, to just again intervene in the most vital way that you can. And at the same time this morning, Lord, we do think of Jesse. We lift him up to you as well, Lord. We pray that you'll give wisdom to the doctors, that uh, you will be able to, to give them and show them how to regulate his medicine. Be with Francis, Lord, as well. Comfort her in this time. And Lord, with all of these requests that we have on this prayer list, there's so many different needs, Lord. There's needs for healing. And Lord, we ask you as a great physician, to do a mighty work in each life. There are those, Lord, 
who need salvation and lord that's the greatest need of any person is to know you as their savior so we ask you lord to open the door of their hearts have them lord invite you in so that lord their lives can be changed for the better and that their lives can begin that first day of the rest of their lives so this morning lord we just ask you speak to our hearts today lord just instill your message within us and lord may we like david say i was glad when they said let us go into the house of the lord bless each one now in jesus name amen well let me invite you to take your bibles this morning and turn again to the book of colossians colossians chapter 2 and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. Now, I know we're a little bit out of order last week. Uh, we were in chapter 3. And uh, we'll probably move around throughout the, the four chapters uh, as we uh, move through uh, this wonderful book that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Uh, again, just uh, for those of you who haven't heard, uh, a number of months ago I was working through uh, preparing my, my various classes for the students at uh, the North Stonington Christian Academy. And I uh, came to the book of Colossians, and as I began to uh, put together uh, the Bible study for, for them, uh, I just was amazed at uh, the, how the Lord was opening my eyes, maybe for the first time. Uh, sometimes I think we look at the epistles, and uh, we just feel that uh, they are personal letters that Paul's writing. And we don't really look at them in depth, and we don't have our eyes open, our spiritual eyes open. And so, uh, again, as I began to put these series of messages together, it's like, wow. The Lord was really speaking to me, and I hope he does the same for you. So uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, I invite you to follow along. Paul writes, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that you may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving or thankfulness. So, as we've been doing, as we look at this, I'd like to give you a, a question to chew on as we begin. And today's question is this. What are the goals that each of us should be struggling for in our lives as well as in our church? And let me say that when pastors are trained for the ministry, one of the things that we're taught is this. We come up with a philosophy of a ministry statement. How are, is the pastor going to develop a ministry within a, a congregation? Secondly, we also have a vision statement for the church. Where do we see the church in one year, and in five years, and in ten years? And then thirdly, what other ministry goals and guidelines do we develop? And so with that in mind, what we see here is having a vision and goals for the church is important. Because Solomon wrote in Proverbs 29, verse 18, he says, Without vision, people perish. So everybody needs goals. Not only the pastor, not only the church, but each and every one of us need goals. You know, in over my life, I have been a goal setter. And uh, I have set goals for my life. Some of them I have achieved. Some of them I've had to just say I'm not going to get there. Uh, one of them was that I was going to do the Ironman Triathlon down there in Hawaii. And uh, I... Fortunately, my body began to fail me before I could ever fulfill that goal. But it was a goal I had, and it was one I worked towards for almost 20 years. So goals are important, and when we look at this, we have to ask ourselves, what is the biblical vision for the church? What are the types of goals each church member should have for themselves and for those that they minister to? Because notice what Paul says in the text. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you. And so this portion of Colossians that we're going to look at this morning is about biblical vision for the church. 
the church as a whole, the church in small groups, and the church as individuals. And this struggle is not only for pastors, but it is for every member of the body of Christ. The struggle is not only for pastors, but it's for the public ministry of the church. Every member of the church should agonize over the goals that we have. And they should agonize over the fact that this agony is not only for the individual, but it's for the church as a whole as we gather together. And when we look at this, even for congregations that we have never seen, we can still impact them. And we can do this by spirit-led prayer. And we've talked about what spirit-led prayer was, because Paul talked about that in the first chapter. We can do this by suffering for the gospel. And there are times when we are going to suffer for the gospel. We can do this by teaching God's word with the intention of making mature disciples of Jesus Christ. So, like Paul, we need to understand what it means to struggle and to agonize so that the church may become all that God has called it to be. In this message, we're going to learn about the goals that every believer should be struggling for in God's house. So the first one, let me give you the first one. Effective ministers, and we all want to be effective ministers, struggle for the church to have strong and encouraged hearts. Notice again what he says. He says, my purpose is that you may be encouraged in heart. And so what does he mean by that, to be encouraged in our heart? Well, that word encourage is interesting because it means to call alongside. And an encouraged or strong heart is important for every believer. Listen to what Nehemiah said to the Jews who were weeping during a spiritual revival. The Jews had returned from Babylon. And when they got into Jerusalem, they realized that things had, were not the same. The walls of the city were, were destroyed. The gates of the city were no longer there. They had been burned. And the people couldn't get the job done. And when Nehemiah, the, the king's cupbearer there in Babylon, heard about it, he was moved in his spirit, and he immediately went to prayer. And in that prayer, he asked God to intervene. And as he's standing before the king, holding the king's cup, the king says, Nehemiah, what's the matter with you? He says, you're sad. And uh, you weren't supposed to be sad in the king's presence. And so he told him exactly why he was sad. And the king says, if you want to go to Jerusalem, go with my blessing. And he arrives there, and as he does this walk around the city one night, he realizes that the work is immense. But he motivates all of the people together, and they gather together, and they rebuild the walls, and they hang the gates, and then they gather together, and they hear the word of God being read. And the people stand from sunup to noontime. They stand there in the hot, blazing sun, and they listen to the Levites reading the word of God. And the people hear the word of God for the first time, and their eyes open up in tears, and they are weeping. And though this is what he says, he says, finally, my go and enjoy choice, choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's the message. The joy of the Lord is when we have strong and encouraged hearts. If we can experience the joy of the Lord in our lives, even through difficult times, we're going to have hearts that are encouraged. The scripture continually commands us to really experience the joy of the Lord. Paul, when he wrote to the Philippians, said very much the same thing. He said, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. So Paul says when we rejoice in the Lord, it becomes a safeguard. It becomes almost like that hedge of protection around us. And Paul commands them again to be encouraged. In Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Joy was such an important aspect or an important message that Paul wanted the Philippians to understand. So we ask ourselves, why? Why is it important for us as individuals and as a church to have the joy of the Lord and to be encouraged and have strong hearts? Well, I'll tell you this. It's because a discouraged and a depressed Christian is not good for very much. They can't serve, they can't fight for themselves spiritually, and they're often prone to falling into sin. That's why God, through Scripture, works so hard to encourage us. He wants us to control our emotions. He wants our emotions to really be, have this hedge of protection around it. He says our emotions, our heart, should not control us. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? 
And because of that, the believer must learn to control his heart and to control his emotions. We also need to have a strong mind. When scripture refers to the heart, it refers not only to, to the emotions, but also to the mind. The psalmist said, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Our mind, our will, all that we are is imperative for us as believers to have that strong mind because that is going to be the focus or the attack point that Satan is going to come after us with. Listen to what Paul said regarding the believer's warfare. He says the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. To not have a strong mind means that we are going to be susceptible to being led away from Jesus Christ. Then, once that occurs, then we are captured. We are taken into the stronghold of Satan, and we must protect against that. And we do that by having a strong mind, by being encouraged, by having our heart encouraged in that same way. And Paul struggled for the church to have that strong heart. What was happening in Colossae was that these false teachers were coming in, and they were coming up and saying, Jesus Christ is not sufficient for your salvation. You need more. You need this additional revelation. They, they said there's a more knowledge that you don't have, and we do. And we have to say to ourselves, then how do we encourage, or how do we develop that encouraged heart, that, that strong mind? And one thing we can do is this. We develop a strong heart and a strong mind through the study of the Word of God. We keep coming back to what the Word of God does for us. Psalm 19, uh, verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. When the Word of God takes up residence in our heart, we can then experience the joy of the Lord. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this, to, to this world or to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So both the heart and the mind need to be strengthened. They need to be encouraged. Do you have a strong heart? Do you want to have a heart that is free of worries? A heart that is free of discouragements? We need to have a heart then that is full of the word of God. The word of God gives us joy in the heart and it renews our mind. And that's what Paul is telling us. Fill your mind with the word of God. Secondly, Christians can develop a strong heart and a strong mind by being encouraged by other believers. Why do we gather together here on a Sunday morning? Why do we have fellowship on Wednesday nights? It's so that we can build one another up. It's so that we can encourage one another. It's so that we can pray for one another. Paul said, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. When Paul talks about imparting a spiritual gift, he's talking really about the entire book of Romans that he wrote. And the book of Romans, while some people say it's very theological, at the same time it's very practical. And he wanted to teach them the word of God. Moreover, he says they would be encouraged not only by the word of God, but then by their relationships with other believers. Paul says this about seeing Timothy. He said in 2 Timothy 1.4, Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. They had been separated for quite some time. Paul had sent Timothy to another church. And now he was missing him to the point where he says, I have tears because I miss you so much. And you know... When we missed a Sunday, as we did a few, few weeks ago, and we had a blizzard, and we came back the following Sunday, it seemed like we were apart forever. Two weeks is such a long time. Same thing if you go away on vacation and you're away from the fellowship for a period of time. You come back and you say, I missed you. You know, when we, we had uh, the Wednesday night dinner start, it was so great to see people coming and to see everybody happy and enjoying themselves and fellowshipping together again. That's why we gather together the way we do, is so that we can encourage one another and build one another up. Many believers lack strong hearts and minds because they lack intimate fellowship, not only with Jesus Christ, but with one another. You know, they try to walk the Christian life alone. They try to be lone rangers, so to speak. But one of the ways that we find encouragement is by being around our brothers and sisters in Christ. Third, Christians can develop a strong heart and a strong mind 
by recognizing and getting rid of those bad thoughts in their mind. Paul talks about the Christian's warfare. He says every Christian is going to be involved in war. We are called to break down strongholds, and the mind is to be really protected by the power of God. Negative thoughts, he says, need to be destroyed. They need to be removed. We need to focus on the, the important things, the good things that are there. They need to take those thoughts captive, and they need to avoid them. They need to encourage the strong things and to do away with the <coughs> negative things. Others have strongholds of fears and anxieties. They worry about everything. Paul said just the opposite. He said, don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. Solomon, again, in Proverbs says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. You know, we can, we can choose. We can make a choice. And the choice is this. We can choose to be anxious for nothing. To do away with the worry. To do away with the fears. And to practice the biblical principles that Paul is presenting for us here. In order to have a strong and encouraged mind, believers must really learn how to wage war on their thought processes. They must put in good things, such as the Word of God, and they must reject all the things that don't agree with God or Jesus' revelation. Fourth, believers develop a strong heart and a strong mind through prayer. Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. Paul prayed for the Ephesians, he prayed for the Colossians, he prayed for, for those in Philippi, he prayed for every church individually, and he said the same thing over and over again. He said, I pray that you will be strengthened in your inner being by the Holy Spirit. I pray that your inner being will be strengthened. You know, if we want to have a strong church, if we want a church that can withstand the attacks of Satan, if we want to have a church that we can can be sure is going to have an impact in our community and an impact in our world, we must be a church that prays. And that prayer is vital for the life of the church. Our prayer should be, Lord, strengthen and encourage the hearts of every believer at Second Baptist Church. Satan has trapped too many Christians. They are walking around depressed, they're walking around discouraged, and they have lost the joy of the Lord. Let us pray that God will strengthen our church in its inner being. Let us pray that God will encourage our hearts through his word and through fellowship with one another. Let us pray that God would help us cast down every stronghold and take every thought captive for him. That must be the goal of our church, and it must be the goal of every individual member of the church. <coughs> then next, effective ministers struggle for the church to be united in love. Notice again what he says, my purpose is that you may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Paul's second goal is that he wants the church to be united or to be unified. With the false cult that was attacking the church, not only were some of the people getting discouraged, but there was division in the church. There was one school here and there was another school here. And the result was is that there was no unity. So the thing that Paul prays for here is unity. And Jesus did the exact same thing in his high priestly prayer there in John chapter 17. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you and are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Not only was it Paul's goal for the church to be united, but it was also that of Jesus Christ. This prayer was answered at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples there in the upper room, the church was formed. And as it grew, it grew in exponentially. 3,000 on one day, 5,000 on another day. And as the persecution came upon them, and they were driven out of Jerusalem, and they were driven and, and persecuted throughout the world, instead of the church disappearing or going into hiding, it continued to grow. 10 out of the 11 original apostles were willing to die for their faith in Jesus Christ. When they were told, either give up Christ or die, they said, I would rather die than deny Christ. That's power. 
and they were encouraged. They were united in their message. They traveled throughout the known world at that time, carrying the message of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they had seen him, and they knew him, and they preached him. And we should have that same desire. The church became the body of Christ on the day of Pentecost. And this unity of the body must still be worked out practically. In every church, we should see this unity of love that brings us together. It must be something to be labored for. It must be something to be worked at in every congregation. Because what Satan wants to do is he wants to bring division. He wants to bring disunity. He wants to have problems within the church. What do we have to do to have unity in the church and in our relationships? Think of it. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And he commands them, he says, Make every effort. He says, Don't leave a stone unturned. Then how do we do that? First and foremost, by forgiving one another. And when I say forgiving one another, I'm talking about how God forgives us. How he separates the, our sin as far as the east is from the west, and he forgives us. Second thing is by being a peacemaker. Instead of going to war with somebody else, we make peace with them. By being humble and putting other inter others' interests above our own. Because when we are united, when we are unified, the benefit is, is that he says you will be united in love. And then the benefits that come are beyond measure. First of all, if we are united in love, if we are unified as a body, then we're going to strive for evangelism. Then we're going to strive to carry the message out into the world and not just keep it here in these four walls. Because notice what Jesus said. He says, I pray that you will be one as the Father and he are one. He says, why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's evangelism. When the church is not unified, Evangelism is stifled. Church unity is essential to carrying the gospel. And that is why the enemy works so hard to bring division. Because if there's division there, there'll be no evangelism. Secondly, a second benefit is church unity is God's blessing is seen in the empowerment and in fruitfulness. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life, forevermore. The psalmist, as he writes here, he talks about people living together in harmony, living together in unity. And he says that's when God's blessing is present. And he uses the, the symbol of the oil that was poured upon Aaron when he was anointed as high priest. And he says the oil was poured on his head and it began to run down upon him and down his beard. And that was a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the power that God was instilling in him. And that's what happens to us. He says when we're in unity with one another, the power of the Holy Spirit is at its fullest. Because then we don't war with one another. Because what happens is, is the Holy Spirit lives and dwells in every one of us. And if the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us and we have given control to the Holy Spirit of our hearts, of our emotions, of all of our being, what will happen is we will be at peace with one another because the Holy Spirit will not war with the, with the Holy Spirit in you. He also says, it's like the dew from heaven that falls on Mount Hermon. And the dew, what he was expressing was that waters the trees, it waters the plants, and the result of it is, is then they can produce fruit. Where there is no unity, there is no fruit. There is no fruitfulness. The Holy Spirit cannot produce fruit when there's division. A third blessing of unity is protection from the evil one. Think of it. Paul said this. He says, if you are harboring poverty and anger in your hearts, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. This unity just opens the door for Satan. We have a, he, if he gets a foothold in the church, or in a marriage, or in an individual life, he is going to take that advantage and push it to the furthest he possibly can. So Paul prays for the, the church to be united in love. 
And may our church experience that wonderful unity and harmony. Then effective ministers struggle for the church to be protected by having a full understanding of Christ. Here again is another one of the goals that Paul was praying for. He desired the church to have a complete understanding of Christ. Well, I don't think any of us can ever fully attain that. But certainly that's a goal that we all should have. To have that complete understanding of Jesus Christ. And this is the various, the, the, this is the actual thing that this cult that had come to Colossae was trying to do. It was attacking the deity of Christ. They said he was a man. He was what? They talked about the sufficiency of Christ. His death on the cross wasn't enough for salvation. You had to do more. They attacked the gospel itself, saying it's too simple. Remember what Paul said? He said, to the Gentiles, the gospel is foolishness. It made no sense to them. If somebody could die on a cross, and that death on the cross could save anyone who believed. <coughs> to the Jews, it became a stumbling block. What is the full understanding of Christ? First of all, Christ is the only way to godliness. He came to this earth and he died. He was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was seen by the angels of the tomb. He has been preached among the nations. He has been, been believed on by people. Excuse me. He has ascended into heaven, and now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is the mystery that the Christian church, that the Colossian church, needed to fully understand. They needed to understand the sufficiency of Christ, the completeness of his sacrifice. And Paul said, I struggle for this. I agonize over this. He says, because I don't want you to be deceived. And we should have that same struggling, that same agonizing than to make sure that no one is deceived by Satan's lies. So how do we come to a complete understanding of the mystery of Christ? Well, first of all, it is through developing a strong mind through the Word of God again. We keep coming back to that. Coming to a complete understanding of Jesus Christ is a result of having an encouraged heart and being united in love. When we can experience that, then what happens is, now, through the Word of God, we have that power. We have that empowerment. And through the Word of God, our minds will be strengthened. Our will will be strengthened. Our emotions will be strengthened. Because a weak mind can't be turned. A weak mind will be turned away from the truth of the Word of God. Paul is essentially giving them the proper doctrine so they will not be led astray. And that's why we preach the Word of God week in and week out here at Second Baptist Church. We want you to understand what the Word says. We want you to understand that as you fill yourself with the Word of God, your life is going to change. You're going to become a strong believer. You're going to become united in love. You're going to be encouraged in your heart. And the result of it is, is that then it's impossible for someone to come and lead you astray. Again, the path of the believer cannot be walked alone. Think of it. The lone sheep was the one who was most vulnerable to the attack of the wolf. And the same thing is true. Satan is going about as a raging lion, Peter said, and that lion is seeking whom he may devour. And this may seem a little bit odd, but effective ministers struggle for the church to develop military discipline. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Now Paul uses two military terms. He uses orderly and firm. And these two words really describe an army that is solidly united against the enemy. Order describes that arrangement of the troops into ranks. And every soldier has a place, and every place was important. And he says the same is true of the church. Every member that is here, everyone that Christ has brought into this fellowship is important. 
and you have a place and you have an area of service and when we are orderly and when you are in that right place the church can do amazing things he says we are to stand firm and that means that we are ready in battle array we have on the whole armor of God we are standing there in a formation ready to do battle with the enemy and we present a solid united front to the enemy Christians are to make progress both in discipline and obedience. You know, way back in 1970 when I went to boot camp after finishing uh, ROTC at Northeastern University, I spent six weeks at Indian Town Gap Military Reservation in Anvil, Pennsylvania. And everywhere we went, we marched. We marched in order, and we marched in columns, we marched in rows. And when we marched, we either sang a song or we counted off one, two, three, four. And as we did, it was so that we would stay in step and we would be in our right place. And when we would arrive at one of the training sites, then we sat again by platoon, by company. We were always in order. We were always standing firm. And to know our place in God's army is to be assured that we are going to be able to stand firm and be ready to face the enemy when he attacks. The very foundation of a solid army is leadership. And we must be willing to follow the leadership. Think of it. If you had a company, if you ran a company, and there was no leadership in the company, and everybody just did their own thing, they came in when they wanted to come in, and they went home when they wanted to come home, and maybe they could do some work if they wanted to, it would not be a very successful company. Well, the same is true of the church. If you just come part-time, if you just come, sit in the pew, and then leave. If you're not involved in service, you're not involved in, in, in fellowship, then why are you here? The whole reason for the church is so that we can fellowship together. We can build one another up. We can comfort one another. We can warn with one another. Christ has brought every single one of you here and made you part of this fellowship for a purpose. And it's important for you to know what that purpose is. And when we stand firm, he says that's the ability to persevere through any attack or any hardship that comes our way. You know, Paul took great delight. He said, I see, I am delighted to see how firm you are in, there, in your faith. As a pastor, I enjoy saying that to people as well. When people come for baptism, as we did last week, they're expressing a, a public testimony of what's happened in their heart. When people stand up and give a testimony on a Sunday night, they're testifying that God is working in their lives. And they're acknowledging the fact that they have a relationship with him. So what's the final? What do we take away from this? Well, we take this away from it. The implication of both of these terms is that there is a willingness in, in the church to die for the church. Jesus said this to his disciples. My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. And how did Jesus love the disciples? He gave his life for them. This is the type of love that we should have for one another. We should be willing to sacrifice for one another. Jesus said the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Paul concludes with these words. So then, <clears throat> just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. Paul concludes this portion of the letter by really giving a challenge. And that challenge is, he says, continue to live in him. You know, the Christian life is a lifelong experience. It is a lifelong endeavor. You know, as I was sitting there this morning thinking, as Cam gave the announcement regarding Reverend Cloud, a few weeks ago, uh, Marianne, my wife, had me listen to a message by Dr. Jeremiah. And it was about the fact that it said, Christians don't get to retire. He said, once you call, you're called. 
Jesus doesn't say, oh, you reached 65, here's your social security, go sit over there in the pew. No. He said, you're to serve until he tells you not to serve. So, I'm doing my best is to serve. You know, when Paul says continue to live in him, that could also be translated walk in him. You know, that moment that you accept that Jesus Christ as your Savior is just the beginning of your faith. It starts there. And then it continues on and on and on until you step into the kingdom of heaven. Paul says this is how we are to continue in the faith. We continue in Christ by knowing we are truly saved and being rooted in him. We continue in Christ by growing in him, being built up in Christ. We continue in Christ by being strengthened in the body of faith. And we continue in Christ by developing an attitude of thankfulness. That's my challenge to each of you and myself. Let us continue in Christ or let us walk in him, not just today, but as many days as we have ahead of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, as we've taken these just seven verses of Scripture, Lord, there's so much there for us. It's like a feast. It's like a banquet that you have set before us. To be encouraged in our hearts, to be united in love, to continue in our faith, Lord, there are challenges that you've given us. Lord, may each of us accept that challenge. May we say, I want to do better. I have not done as well as I can, but I can do better. Strengthen me, Lord. Encourage me. And help me to move forward walking with you in all things. And Lord, if there's someone here who has not taken that first step, who have not begun to walk with salvation, who have not begun the path of sanctification, and I pray that they would do that today, whether here in the sanctuary or watching online, that in the quietness of your heart, you will speak out and reach out to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, take away my past, and set me on that right path. I want to follow you, and I want to know you, I want to know the mystery and the complete fullness of knowing you. And we will ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue closing out our service with hymn number 93. Praise the name of Jesus. We'll sing this through twice. If you want to pray, altar's always open. Pastor's up here. If you please stand. Sing this together through twice. Glory be.